Hello everyone and welcome to this March 2024 Food Thinkers. Um, our Food Thinkers seminar series brings together big ideas in academia, policy, business and advocacy on redesigning food systems. I'm uh, Rebecca Wells and I'm a senior lecturer at the Centre for Food Policy and I'm really delighted to welcome so many of you joining us today um, to hear from Professor Roberta Sanino, who's Professor of Sustainable Food Systems at the University of Surrey. Welcome Roberta. Um, great to see the numbers still rising and uh, uh, of, of participants. Um, we're all really looking forward to this session today. Um, before we get going, I'm going to uh, run through a few housekeeping um, notices just to, to give you um, some uh, information um, in case you need it during the session. Um, so the webinar is being recorded and will be made available online afterwards via our YouTube channel. And I think uh, the link is going to be put in the chat shortly in case you need that later, if you want to revisit this or any of our other Food Thinker sessions. Um, if you have any questions for Roberta, um, we'll be having a Q&A after her talk, uh, which I think is about half an hour long, about 30 minutes long. And then we have about half an hour uh, at least for, for questions, so plenty of time for those questions. But please do write them in the Q&A box instead of the chat as you think of them. Um, the questions will be read out um, or uh, um, we'll, we'll be trying to thematically group them together and then um, address them after, you've, after Roberta's given her talk. And we'll try to respond to as many as we can. Um, unfortunately, this isn't always possible, but we'll do our very best. Um, if you'd like to tweet about uh, today's Food Thinkers webinar or um, on using uh, X or any other uh, of our uh, social media platforms, um, please use the hashtag Food Thinkers and the handle at Food Policy City. So there won't be a Food Thinkers webinar next month, but we will be hosting our City Food Policy Symposium. Um, it's already sold out, uh, which is exciting, um, but I hope you've already got a ticket. If not, um, I think we will be making some recordings of, of bits of that as well. Um, we'll be back with a talk from Dr. Chichi Ekator on Tuesday, the 21st of May, and bookings for that talk, um, that webinar will open next month. And we'll also be hosting a virtual taster session for our Masters in Food Policy next Monday, the 25th of March. So if you're interested in finding out more about the programme, um, please do come along. Elaine will put a link for signing up in the chat box if you want to sign up. Um, for a uh, last minute um, coming along to that, um, that session about the MSC food policy. So uh, on to uh, Roberta Sanino, who we're delighted to have here. Um, well known, I'm sure, to most of you. Certainly um, her work is well known to us in the Centre for Food Policy. Uh, really fantastic and useful work on, on um, urban, urban food policy uh, at, at the local city and city level and, and much else besides. Um, Roberta is Professor of Sustainable Food Systems at the University of Surrey. Over her career, she's produced more than 100 publications on food systems, some of which have been translated into many different languages. Uh, she has established track record of creating impact and engagement at the interface of food systems research and policy. And today, as I said, she's going to be talking about the urban food agenda, aligning research and policy. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Roberta um, with many thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. And I'd like to start by thanking uh, City University for the invitation to speak today. I am an old friend of City, having had Tim Lang in particular, as one of my main uh, inspirations and a great mentor as well uh, over my career. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm going to speak, as Rebecca mentioned, about the so-called urban food agenda. It's been a great opportunity for me to receive this invitation. It's really provided me with an opportunity to reflect on many, many years of engagement with this topic how it's changed and where is it going in my view. Um, let me start by the way of uh, background with uh, just a few words about the overall context for my presentation, the global development agenda, which I think is embodied with what I call a renewed urban optimism. I have uh, uh, inserted in this slide the pictures of uh, some key documents, such as the UN Habitat um, New Urban Agenda, as well as the Urban Agenda for the EU, which I think have significantly contributed to position cities as the strategic site 
to address complex socio-ecological problems, cities as the site to pursue sustainable development. And this optimism is particularly evident in relation to food. For a very long time as researchers, we approached cities primarily in conjunction with food insecurity. Cities were the places where the interdependent pressures that shape food insecurity converge. Over the last uh, 15 years or so, the tone and approach have changed. Cities have increasingly been described, I would say, as the optimal scale for food policy innovation. There is at this point in time an extensive body of research that's documented the emergence of the so-called urban food agenda. What is the urban food agenda? Well, simply put, it's a concerted effort by city governments around the planet um, to do four things, really. Promote more joined up food policies, enhance civil society participation in the governance of food systems, create more positive, more reciprocal relationships with surrounding rural areas, and incentivize multi-actor collaborations and knowledge exchange. Let me briefly go through these four, um, what I would call pillars of the urban food agenda. Um, systems thinking as a distinctive feature of the so-called urban food strategies or urban food policies, depending on the level of formalization that exists. Um, the connection between cities and systems thinking comes primarily out of many, many discourse analyses that have been done by myself, but also many others. Um, need, what type of narrative are urban food uh, strategies proposing? And definitely researchers agree that one of the newest, the most distinctive elements is the tendency to structure these policies or strategies around an explicit recognition of the multidimensional connections that food has with other contexts, sectors, community systems. Participatory governance is another main feature of the urban food agenda that's been extensively researched in the last 15 years. Uh, it's been repeatedly said how um, municipal governments have created connections with a wider set of actors beyond the traditional policy setting. And as I've written in one of my papers on this topic, it's through these efforts, and here I'm referring in particular to institutional arrangements such as food policy councils and the like, governance mechanisms that have enabled civil society to leave the margins of the governance arena and become a proactive rather than just reactive agent of positive change. The third feature of the urban food agenda is a new relationship with the rural. The capacity, at least in terms of narrative discourse, overall approach to reimagine the city as a socio-technical system based on the circulation rather than the exploitation of rural resources. Obviously, I'm summarizing here uh, really massive bodies of literature those of you who have somewhat engaged with the planning system, for example, planning literature in countries like the UK, will have come across um, criticisms of the so-called urban-rural divide, uh, or simply put, historically, the tendency to look at cities as centers of mass consumption uh, and rural areas as centers of food production for ever-expanding uh, urban populations. Urban food strategies are proposing what I've called in one of my uh, early articles, a new localism. They are using food as a prism to create or strengthen uh, more reciprocal, more positive environmental and socioeconomic connections with rural areas. And it's in this context that a number of scholars, but also policy documents have proposed the notion of city region food systems. I'll come back to this later on, 
But I would say for the purpose of understanding or providing a general overview of the urban food agenda, the city region food system is uh, um, a way of looking at the rural as an integral part of the city. Last but not least, there's a translocal dimension of the urban uh, food agenda, um, or um, the what I call the formation of spaces of convergence, where progressive city governments are exchanging knowledge, lessons learned, insights to try and articulate new collective visions for food system transformation. I am illustrating translocalism with two very relevant initiatives in my view. FAO Food for Cities initiatives, one of the oldest launched in 2001 by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, which is very much centered upon the notion of city region food system, and uh, the Sustainable Food Places Network in the UK. I'm hoping that uh, some of them are actually connected with this webinar. Um, I had the honor of contributing to establish the Sustainable Food Places Network many, many years ago. This is now one of the largest national network of cities and towns. There are more than 100 UK cities and towns involved in this network to try and transform their food system. Now, uh, the, an initial phase in the literature characterized by what I call the discourse analysis of urban food policies or strategies has been followed by a tendency to produce case studies. We have a really high number of case studies uh, on cities and food. Case studies we know have performative power when focus on examples of best practice, which is very much the case in the realm of urban food, case studies make some cities quickly be become emblematic for urban food system innovation. And although this is important to draw lessons uh, for other cities, the reality is that there is also a danger involved with that in, in that kind of work, the danger of creating or strengthening an uneven geography of winners and losers, or we can say leaders and laggards. Indeed, uh, and I have uh, criticized my own work in this respect, my early work, the literature at some point has, in my view, expressed a tendency to fetishize the urban or quoting from one of my relevantly rele um, recent articles published in Urban Studies to reduce it to a discrete special category that somewhat exists in isolation prior to or as a background against people's lives. Too much emphasis on best practice. Uh, this is one of my reflections for today's seminar may eventually uh, inadvertently support what I call the performance-based governance, one of the mantras of our time. The use of global governance idioms, which I've represented in this slide, resilient or smart cities, for example, global governance idioms that evoke aggregated data, arbitrary thresholds, techno-managerial fixes, um, I think the time has come for us to uh, work together and escape this performance-based governance trap. In my work, I've criticized it on at least three fundamental grounds. First of all, I've, I've argued standardized measurements, metrics, indicators tend to flatten what is actually a very complex geography of urban contexts that have differential capacities to act. Differential capacities in terms of planning, in terms of mayoral influence, in terms of mobilizing capacity of the civil society, and even in terms of data collection. Because we have to remember that in regions like the Mediterranean, for example, or in many countries of the global south, there are many informal flows informal flows of people, resources, ideas, knowledge, which obviously provide a major challenge 
to the quantification of urban food systems. The second criticism is that performance-based governance is not at all helpful to address the root causes of inequality and environmental degradation that cities are uh, somewhat facing. It doesn't help us to uh, address, for example, the role of formal and informal power structures in shaping the relationship that a city has with food. Last but not least, standardized measurements, metrics, indicators that characterize performance-based governance are diverting attention away from the barriers that uh, unfortunately all city governments, even the most progressive, are facing. And here I could be talking a very long time about barriers, but I have tried to summarize the core of the problem in bold in this slide, the institutional lethargy at higher levels of governance. And here I'm referring in particular to the atrophy of national governments, national governments that have set mandates, obsolete governance structures, historical ingrained agendas, and departments that work in silos, as we know. My most recent paper on uh, this topic was published just last year, identifies in particular four areas where municipal governments, city governments would urgently need intervention by their national level. First of all, knowledge. Let's remember national governments are funders of large research programs. They define research agendas in many ways. And I think it's a time, um, I'm, I'm referring to one specific call that is out right now um, on food. We should be moving away from notions of resilience again and try to focus our research far more on the lived experiences and ordinary practices of ordinary citizens. I'll come back to this in a minute. Obviously, national governments also have uh, quite substantial budgets that urgently need to be allocated, at least in part, to the nodal points of the food system, as I call them, the infrastructure, uh, wholesale markets, food hubs, an infrastructure that is disappearing at an alarming rate, especially in countries like the UK, and that city governments alone do not have the capacity to, to rebuild. And then, of course, we could discuss the importance of uh, receiving support from national governments in terms of regulation and legislation, contesting the role of profit-driven multinational conglomerates that continues to uh, shape the urban food environment in complicated ways. But national governments could also play a role in terms of trade, um, reorientating trade flows more around needs, I wrote in this article, just to prevent the situations in which the short supply chains that many city governments are attempting to forge have to compete with cheap imports from other countries. And national governments could do a lot in terms of setting clearer decarbonization targets and better regulating the relationship between suppliers and supermarkets. Public procurement is another example of intervention. In fact, I did come to work on cities while I was involved in a quite substantial research project on public procurement. It was the field that gave me the idea of how much cities can do to transform food systems, especially if and when supported at higher levels of governance. So looking ahead, uh, what I'm saying here, I think, is that to be politically meaningful, the urban food agenda needs to engage with issues of power. This is where I see the research agenda going for us. We need to start asking some big questions. Who really holds power within the emerging urban foodscapes? whose con concerns are prioritized, but also whose concerns are rendered invisible in our cities. Answering this question for me 
uh, entails first and foremost problematizing notions that are widely used in relation to urban food governance, such as notions of participation and inclusivity. Uh, we need to ask uh, critical questions and remember that partnerships, governance arrangements, even urban-rural linkages are always shaped by distinctive geographic and uh, historic contexts, by multiscalar socio-ecological relations. We will not be able to understand who's empowered but also disempowered by the unfolding of the urban food agenda unless we start focusing on micro, micro politics, start looking at the city through the eyes and the embodied experience of its residents, some of whom we need to remember are completely disengaged from the renewed urban optimism I mentioned at the start of my presentation. Practically, this means for us as academics, uh, for instance, developing truly participatory methodologies that draw upon the experiential knowledge of citizens to collect, map, and analyze food system data, what I called in, uh, in an article, everyday forms of resistance. So to sum up, as I said, to be truly transformative, the urban food agenda must empower citizens. What can we do as academics to contribute to this endeavor I think we need to start producing context-specific information, which is currently absent in many, many cities. Without context-specific information, we will not be able to understand whether this urban food agenda has translated into enhanced human capacities and entitlements across cities. We will not be able to develop truly progressive food policies that translate into enhanced human flourishing. So as researchers, practitioners, policymakers, the big challenge for us at the moment is to learn to see the urban as both a process and an outcome, both of which can and should be reconfigured in more democratic ways. I have tried in recent years to give a contribution to this challenge and uh, I want to say at the start, my contribution or my work in this area uh, starts uh, with uh, a disclaimer. I am being normative here. Uh, I don't try to be objective or scientific. I think if we want to produce research that supports transformative agendas, we need to have the courage to define at the onset of the process the desired outcomes. And one concept that I think can teach us a lot, can, can really give us a lot as academics in support of transformative agenda is the concept of place. Place as relational, multiscalar, socially produced. I had a very interesting exchange with Chris Yap from the center while we were working on the topic for my presentation. And Chris used the word territorial on several occasions. It reminded me of my early work with FAO when we established together an urban food coalition as an outcome of the UN Food System Summit. Endless discussions within the coalition as to whether it was more appropriate to speak about place-based approach or territorial approach. Chris, I'm gonna give you a very quick answer here. I prefer place because I think territoriality in this context is less suitable to account for the vertical governance axis, for the vertical relationships between food system actors and activities. Place, in contrast, is very much about relationships. And uh, I've tried to confess in one slide decades of writing about the concept of place. I also want to apologize to non-academics for having this slide, but I think it's vital to understand the type of contribution I'm trying um, to um, offer here. 
Place as I Send is about relationships. And if you look at this massive literature on place that's been produced primarily by human geographers, you will see that there are four fundamental features that really make it an interesting concept. First of all, place, almost by definition, brings together the social and the natural. It's about the co-constitution of society and nature. Place also fosters, and here I'm referring in particular to what human geographers like Doreen Massey call a progressive sense of place. I've published about this an article at the end of 22, and I'll be happy to give you more um, details about that publication. But um, place offers what we call a progressive understanding of spatial identity. Um, it's about positive interactions. It fosters positive interactions within and between food systems. Approaching place as a social construction, as I define it at the start, evokes everyday lives. The power relations, the politics I mentioned, and there are even consequences for different social groups. Um, I will explain in a bit more detail each of these uh, principles a bit more in depth. Last but not least, place helps us to connect food with other public goods because individual uh, engagements with place are always connected to wider processes, wider political, economic and cultural processes such as trade, migration and so on. Now, what I have done while I was in the uh, process of writing an Horizon Europe uh, proposal for the European Commission is to try and translate the principles, the abstract principles of a place-based approach into a framework, which is called the CLIC. And uh, I'm extremely proud to share with you the news that the CLIC framework, which informed this bid, has received 12 million euros of funding from the European Commission. So we are testing uh, the CLIC and the place-based approach inherent in it across eight European city regions. I think some of my partners in this project are connected, so I look forward to the uh, discussion about the challenges, but also the opportunities that the CLIC is presenting. So CLIC stands for co-benefits, linkages, inclusion, and connectivities. The four, in a sense, uh, um, embodiments of the um, principles I uh, listed in my previous slide. Co-benefits, simply put, means ensuring that activities that realize benefits in one sustainability dimension don't produce damage in other um, dimension, in other sustainability dimensions. Linkages is the urban rural. It's about breaking um, spatial fixes, such as the urban rural divide, giving emphasis instead to hybridity, to reciprocity. Inclusion, um, as I mentioned earlier on, a progressive sense of place in particular orientates attention around the connections between people's everyday lives and the wider power dynamics that at times are responsible for their socio-spatial exclusion. And finally, connectivities. Connectivities is all about the relational nature of place, its emphasis on flows, the flows of ideas, knowledge, resources that cut across space. So the CLIC framework brings together these four concepts as tangible and interrelated goals for food system transformation. I want to give you uh, a few examples of what it means to apply the CLIC in practice in the hope of inspiring some of your work uh, in uh, uh, similar areas. Co-benefits is the outcome of the first feature of place, the co-constitution, as I said, of nature and society. It translates into co-benefits or the recognition that sustainability strategies that have specific socioeconomic or environmental goals 
can impact other parts of the food system or other interconnected systems in either a positive or a negative way. In the first case, we have synergies or co-benefits. In the second case, the so-called trade-offs. So thinking and acting in terms of co-benefits means uh, giving relevance to multidimensional activities in the food system, such as urban agriculture, for instance, uh, create an activity that in theory at least, or in its best form, creates synergies between economic, environmental, and social objectives. Uh, we all know, those of us who are familiar with the literature on urban agriculture, there are examples where it contributes to social cohesion, it generates employment opportunities, it helps people to reconnect with nature, so there's an educational dimension, and in some cities, it is indeed increasing access to fresh fruit and vegetables for the population. The L of the click stands for linkages. So this is basically just the territorial dimension of the idea of co-benefits. It's about learning to see the urban and the rural as intricately related and mutually dependent. It's about remembering, remembering that transformative processes towards sustainability should never be territorially exclusive. And this is where the notion of the city region food system um, gains some prominence. The city region for me is a special framework that can help us to isolate, uh, explore and eventually integrate the competing demands of uh, diverse food system actors and policies. So what can we do to create or strengthen better territorial linkages? Um, here, one, one straightforward example is alternative food distribution practices. I'm thinking about community supported agriculture. I'm thinking about fresh food markets, alternative food distribution initiatives that build on local biodiversity and at the same time enhance the availability, accessibility and affordability of healthy and nutritious food for all citizens. Inclusion. Um, I think we all pretty much know how important and urgent um, inclusion is or designing a more inclusive food system is. But I think I want to mention another form of inclusion that I consider particularly important to design robust transformative agenda, and it's the inclusion of knowledges, plural knowledges. As a site of multiple identities and histories, place is very helpful to deconstruct the dominance of scientific knowledge and at the same time recognize the deeply political nature of sustainability transitions, which we know can be framed at times are framed in ways that are critical of the coping strategies of the poor. Um, I'm thinking about simplistic notions of good and bad diets, for example. Um, inclusion is, is also about including different kinds of knowledge and uh, framing food system transformation in an inclusive way, drawing upon the diversity of knowledge of different food system actors, scientific, but also evidence-based, experimental, embodied experience, tacit knowledge. It's about drawing upon these various forms of knowledge, but also the different values that underpin them and that go all the way from socio-ecological justice to economic competitiveness. Finally, the last uh, letter of the click is connectivities. This is simply about the relationships between food and other economic, technological and policy sectors. Uh, those of us who work on food policy are very familiar with the notion of integration, the importance of food policy integration. We've been calling for that for so many years and no policymaker has ever listened. Uh, let's remember, simply put, that malnutrition is never an isolated problem. It's always indicative of underlying socioeconomic and environmental conditions that can only be addressed holistically. This is why it becomes vital from a policy and governance perspective 
to work to connect food with other complex systems and policy priorities, housing, the welfare system, transport, and so on. So my last slide, I'm beginning to reflect on the CLIC framework as the project moves on and we are working um, to uh, apply it in practice. CLIC, as I said, is a normative framework that outlines a direction of travel for food sustainability agendas without overlooking their political nature. Um, it's about uh, promoting place-based research, the type of research that, as I try to explain, uh, focuses on the uneven consequences of transformative processes, as well as on everyday forms of resistance. And in so doing, I think place-based research can really help us to um, foster an active inclusion of a diverse range of communities of stakeholders. It can help us as researchers to envision new socioecological linkages that disrupt persistent and often exclusionary divides, global, local, or urban, rural. It's an invitation in abstract terms, my CLIC framework. It was meant to stimulate the generation of collaborative knowledge. It's an invitation to develop more critical engagements with conflicting agendas and ideas that are hampering food system transformation. So I'm seeing it and proposing it as a means to convert abstract ideas of food system transformation into what I've called a socially meaningful, politically relevant, and generally democratic project. Thank you very much. And uh, I see there are quite a few questions already in the chat, but thanks for your attention. Fantastic, thank you so much, Roberta. And uh, that was a really wonderful overview and perspective on not only your own work over the years, but also the work in the field and really good um, for those of us uh, or those of the audience familiar with the work, but also really exciting to hear uh, um, for, for those of you who's, who've not heard about it before. Um, I particularly um, liked the self-reflection and the kind of critical nature of looking back on your work. Um, I thought well, that was really, really great to sort of have that perspective from you. Um, so as you said, we've got a number of questions. I've tried to group the ones that I've seen. Uh, we may have to just keep going. I'm sure there'll be more coming in. Um, so there's a couple of questions came in about um, methods. Um, so Vivian um, asked about uh, truly participatory research and how can this be achieved in practice? How could we reach um, groups that are disengaged? And similarly, um, Niels was asking about uh, taking a food systems approach and how is this concept meaningful for citizens, policymakers and other stakeholders outside academia? Do you have good examples of that? So I wonder if we could take those two together. Yes, uh, in terms of methods, I think we we are pretty much stuck in a lot of this uh, big European projects. So we are stuck with the so-called uh, living labs as if that was the mechanism to bring together, to truly bring together different kinds of stakeholders from across the food system. My experience of living labs is that they are a really good way of spending time for what I call provocatively middle-class aficionados, people who uh, know about food, they are passionate about food, they have a lot of free time to attend this kind of meetings. I don't have a, a definite answer as to what needs to be done uh, to be truly particip uh, participative or to promote a truly participatory agendas. But one thing I can say that I've learned in my career, you have to go to the vulnerable communities, not expect them to come to a living lab or to a food policy council or the like. So we have to learn as academics to really work and spend time in deprived areas of the city where we can have a, a direct uh, exposure to what these people go through and their everyday forms of resistance. 
Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think um, uh, there's a couple more here that sort of relate to that same, um, just coming in now that relate to that same area. So, um, and, and I, I should say lots of uh, people saying thank you for a very insightful and inspiring, inspiring talk. So thank you again. Um, so uh, Liesl is asking um, whether you see the CLIC framework to have equal utility in transforming food systems in rural areas. So could it increase access and affordability um, in both in both urban and rural areas? Um, and also there's a, another question that relates to what we were just talking about regarding gentrification of sustainable food systems. So this um, sometimes criticising in the way that you've just talked about um, that uh, uh, food system transformation emergence in urban spaces is criticised for reflecting gentrification of sustainable food systems. So how do we make it more equitable? I think you've just partially answered that, but um, I wonder if you could reflect on those those two. <coughs> There are certain challenges that we are facing and that I think it's important to bring up and not to hide underneath our writing. Um, uh, rural areas, so that's an easy answer for me uh, to give. Yes, the clique is not meant to be urban. It's place-based. And as I explain, a place is by definition urban and rural. Place is multiscalar. It's a prism, it's a concept that can help us to think in terms of relationships. So for me, the CLIC framework is could be very useful as an embodiment of the principles of food system transformation. I see that uh, several people have asked me uh, what I mean by food system transformation, what matters to me, what's my normative position in this um, area. Uh, I think for me, uh, for what we really need to uh, transform is power relations. We are not going to transform the food system as a system unless we reconfigure the power relations that I try to, I touched upon in my presentation, I'll buy it briefly. Uh, untapped power of city, of national governments so that could do so much to make the food system better. They've even committed to improve food system after the UN Food System Summit and they're not doing anything. The power um, relations that are excluding so many different types of communities from uh, healthy eating agendas. Uh, we live in a world where uh, a lot of the subsidies in agriculture are going to the least uh, healthy foods. There's no subsidies for fr uh, fruit and vegetables, which are the backbone of a sustainable diet, as I'm sure Elaine well knows. Uh, and so uh, what do we need to transform? Uh, if I were to give a one uh, sentence answer to this question, for me, what needs to be transformed is or reconfigured are the power relations. Thank you. And uh, there's, an, as you said, a, quite a, a number of questions on power. So a couple that I thought we, we could maybe uh, link together was a, around uh, Fiona asking, where can we act in terms of this? So you, you're asking us to, to, to take action to reconfigure those power relationships. And where, where do you think we can act and how? Um, to, to make that reconfiguration. And, and another related one from Callum, um, who's talking about um, working um, with uh, uh, and uh, embracing power dynamics at sustainable food places, um, very aware um, that, uh, or they're often asked why they're, they're not uh, engaging with more with supermarkets and industrial foods, food producers. Um, do you have any recommendations for approaching conflict res resolution between alternative and status quo food system actors? So how can we act, and especially when there are tensions, um, that we know there are tensions within the different sectors of, of the food system? Hi, Callum. Lovely to see you there. Uh, Callum is, another, is a person like me who works across the science policy interface. He does so for the Sustainable Food Places Network I mentioned earlier on. I do that or try to do that in a, the academic world. Um, it's a great question. And uh, of course, uh, we don't uh, individually or those of us who work at the micro level necessarily have the power to achieve everything I mentioned today. 
But on the private sector, um, two things uh, spring to mind. First of all, in my experience, and here I'm referring in particular to my many years of work on public food procurement, the private sector will go wherever the market goes. So it's up to us to try and create a market that's more supportive of healthy eating products. Obviously not up to you, Callum, but in terms of advocacy activities, in terms of pressing national governments, there again, uh, some of the most uh, uh, really reliable and uh, high quality suppliers of uh, school food I have encountered in my life were multinationals that obviously do see an opportunity. They, they're a bit cynical, obviously, in their choices at times, but they go wherever profit is. So let's make the alternative food system also more profitable in some ways or, or easier to engage with, more reliable. And we can talk about opportunities to do so. I also want to mention that uh, when I started my career 21 years ago in the UK, the debate was all about local or organic food. And we were talking about alternative food networks. I don't know, uh, Elaine, if you remember those times. So, so those of us talking about alternative versus conventional. We live at a time that's unprecedented in my view in terms of offering opportunities for transformative agendas. And the very fact that the UN called for a food system summit um, is, is really an indication of how much the languages change and how many different actors now recognize the need for a transformation of the food system. We need to make the most of these times. I think COVID has exposed the fragility of the food system. There are rising levels of food poverty uh, that uh, people are even tired of seeing or reading about. This is the time to act. This is the time where we can together embrace this paradigm and, and try to, all of, of, of course, each of us in a different way, try to offer our own contribution. So do you, uh, and, and do you see that, that, um, that the alternative term, alternative food networks as being as, a, as problematic in that way and the food systems as a much more, uh, a much more holistic way of, of thinking about it and, and a bit less polarizing perhaps? Yes, Elaine, I, I don't think we're going to feed the world with the alternative uh, food uh, networks only. So uh, we need to go beyond that divide as well, conventional versus um, alternative, and try to, to design a system that's first and foremost inclusive. It needs to be inclusive also on that front, inclusive of different types of practices, different types of actors, different types of knowledges as I try uh, to say. And of course, I mean, none of us can do this alone. None of us, and we cannot do it as academics, practitioners cannot do it, the private sector. So what we really need to, and this is the sense of my last slide of my talk, through the click, I have tried to stimulate, I'm given my small contribution to try and stimulate a dialogue around what needs to be done, what needs to be achieved if we are serious about making the food system more sustainable. Thank you. So uh, sort of commenting on that, I think one of our uh, one of our uh, viewers, uh, Baha, has, has talked about um, that that also necessitates researchers to, to challenge power structures as well as citizens and as well as those kind of advocacy groups. Um, but they're also asking about um, to hear your opinion on the current um, farmers uh, protests or, or what they call the farmers turmoil in Europe and do you have any any uh, um, thoughts on that um, that kind of current protests that have been going on recently? Baha that's a that's a difficult question you're asking me um, I don't have a clear answer because I suspect that okay on the one hand uh, the situation is sending clear signals about the unhappiness of food producers and considering what they've been going through with COVID first, the lack of labor workers in the field, 
for example, and uh, the disruption to the supply chains connected with the pandemic, but also with climate change, it's not at all surprising that farmers are unhappy. Um, the seasons are not as clear as they used to be. Growing food is has become extremely difficult for everybody. At the same time, um, I don't think, I think the, the protest is hiding a number of conflicting agendas within it. So there are some farmers obviously opposing to the Green Deal and the effort by the European Commission to green the uh, some policies. I'm thinking precisely about um, policies such as the Farm to Fork or the Green Deal. And that is one example of trade-off that we need to try and avoid. Uh, we should be working to create synergies between agriculture and environmental conservation involving farmers, because I, you know, all the work I've done with farmers in the past, including in Italy, so not just in the UK, but also in Italy, in Brazil, I've worked in, in North America. Farmers do care about the environment. So uh, I'm slightly annoyed by uh, this message coming from the media that they are opposing the environmental agenda. There may be some of them who are, but I don't think they are uh, opposing the environmental agenda as such. And again, dialogue, looking for synergies, trying to minimize trade-offs between policy messages and narratives. We've got a couple of questions around um, power and economic markets um, related to the a little bit to the earlier discussion we were having around um, the the power in terms of um, supermarkets and uh, big what you might call big food. So Anna Maria is asking whether you'd link power relationships with market relations, as in broad economic markets shaping food systems. Um, uh, and she's studying urban food markets and urban food systems in Peru and Latin America, and she finds economic relations strongest. Um, yeah. Another another uh, viewer is asking us whether um, how we can tackle the power that's in the hand of in, in industrial production and supermarkets when it it relates to kind of market forces and the choice of the kind of dominating middle classes. Yes, uh, this is, uh, I totally agree with you, Anna Maria, in relation to uh, the connection between um, power holders and, and market giants in many ways. We know, uh, we know that food system governance has been uh, in, in many, in many ways has been progressively um, connected or, or or left in the hands of power giants. And this is precisely where I think that the intervention of national governments is crucial, making sure that there are fair, fairer relationships between supermarkets and suppliers in terms of, so redistributing value across the food system is vital. I'm thinking about the urban food environment, and that is another key concept in the food click project that we are working on, how to reconfigure the urban food environment so as to make it more inclusive, more enabling of healthy eating choices and practices. As things stand, not only it's dominated by uh, ads and uh, billboards, uh, fast food outlets and the like, but let's remember the thorny problem of the so-called food deserts in uh, our cities. There are in uh, large cities, you know, I'm thinking about New York, I've seen it with my own eyes, for example, entire neighborhoods where people have no access to healthy and uh, uh, fresh food. So the city of New York introduced a really interesting initiative at the time called the Green Cart, allocating extra permits to street food vendors who committed themselves to bring fresh fruit and vegetables to deprived areas. It's an example, a small example of uh, how some of the problems we are facing can be solved with relatively inexpensive solutions. 
But I think what I'm trying to say here is probably the, the culture associated with food, the dominant culture that needs to be changed. And we could be talking forever about the damage done by the cheap food culture in countries like the UK, where people don't know that cheap food is an illusion. It doesn't exist because the damage is produced by the or generated by the production of that cheap food are paid in other budgetary accounts. So, you know, um, it's a very complicated, we are dealing with an enormous, uh, with a really complex challenge here. And we shouldn't be making sound, uh, I, at least I didn't try to make it sound as if, if it's a simple one to um, address. I just thought that with a view to changing, reconfiguring power relations, a place-based uh, framework could offer a starting point to us all. And I hope you're gonna take home something uh, about it, <laughs> that you're gonna find that it, it could be used not just to design policies, but it's meant also to guide the analysis of data on transformation. Uh, it's meant to guide the monitoring of transformative agendas. It's just a way of having something to work with rather than just continuing to scream about the importance of reconfiguring power relations and not knowing where to start, Elaine, right? <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult, isn't it? It's very difficult. But I think it's always useful to have a have something to base, base your work on and base your thoughts on. And uh, depending on where you are in the context in which you're in, really useful to have a framework. Um, Cornelia is asking um, regarding the CLIC framework, um, whether you have any other co-benefit examples that you could give, um, any coming from different areas rather than production? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, well, from the health perspective, um, I would say a perfect example, a very basic example of co-benefit is the one health notion so making sure that what's good for humans, it's also good for the environment. So um, it's uh, uh, making sure that healthy food is also environmentally benign in terms of production. Doesn't The production of healthy food doesn't create damage to the environment and potentially generates um, opportunities for uh, also for inclusion of marginalized groups. It's accessible to marginalized groups as well so um it's uh, uh demand uh, driven i think what matters here is to develop the frame of mind of thinking in terms of environment economy and society the famous triple bottom line of of sustainability when we make our choices so something that is good for our health could be very bad for the environment and vice versa. So, and uh, in many cases, it's impossible to find the perfect product, the perfect food. What we need to do, what the click is telling us to do in some ways is let's try and maximize the opportunities to create synergies across those three dimensions. And let's try to minimize the damage. And then, of course, it's um, nothing in, is set in stone. Sometimes we don't even have the elements to understand uh, whether we are producing co-benefits. But, you know, it's more as a principle, the idea of taking into account economic equity, social inclusion, environmental integrity in everything we do. Thank you. There's a couple of um, uh, participants talking about uh, Brazil. Uh, Claudia, oh, yes, uh, my, one of my favorite countries. Oh, good, good. Uh, Claudia, yes, I uh, saw the question. Can I say, OK, so we talk about cities that have really revolutionized the food system. One of the most classic examples and a city that I would invite you all to look at if you want to see how much a city can do is Belo Horizonte. Belo Horizonte was one of the earliest cities um, in, in actually on the planet, as far as I'm concerned, 
to subsidize canteens for uh, public canteens for people, uh, struggling people, people in poverty. They have an incredible system that develop an incredible system to make sure that unutilized foods from the fresh markets go to the canteens. They came very much from the poverty angle, but they've really offered an incredible inspiration uh, years and years ago when uh, other cities were just, you know, coping with the with the problems, but not finding solutions. There are many really great examples of best practice in, in Brazil and, and from a policy perspective. And obviously, they have enlightened policies in place to make sure that, it, to go back to one of the previous questions, in Brazil, due to a law that was introduced in 2009, 30% of the school food market is reserved to what they call family farmers. And so there's no way that a corporation in Brazil could take over a public food market because some of it is really um, uh, is targeting small scale artisanal producers. I think Brazil is for me, it has always been a great inspiration. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, and the, the, another kind of question relating to that is uh, relating to uh, how to make uh, urban agendas more equitable, which a lot of our discussion actually has been been talking about um, this afternoon. Um, uh, uh, so Lydia is asking um, part of her question, asking you know who, who again should be involved in driving the agendas and how can we make it more inclusive, but also suggesting that we can um, cities in the global north could could take some lessons from urban agroecology in Rio de Janeiro slums. Um, so I I wonder, do you think? Yeah, how do you think um, we can make the urban agendas more equitable or who who, who do you think should be involved? We've already touched on that a little bit. Um, 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 I wonder if you could say say any more about that. Um, well, I think, uh, of course, we need to think as a, as a governance expert, my mind always goes to the horizontal governance axis, but also to the vertical. And I've spoken a lot about the vertical axis. I have to say, from my own experience, having worked closely with both FAO and the European Commission in the last few years, I've seen a lot of activity going on at the global level. And of course, I've seen a lot going on at the local level, or in this case, the urban level. The atrophy is in the middle. And so um, it's, it's the national governments as far as the vertical axis goes. Horizontally, the situation is not that dissimilar in that uh, when we think about, for example, leaving labs or creating round tables to discuss food system transformation, the missing voices are on the one hand, as I said, uh, communities, vulnerable communities, people on low income, refugees, migrants. There are a lot of missing voices in our round tables. But even when it comes to representation from the food system, I'm also always uh, really shocked by the lack of engagement of the missing middle of the food system. People representing processing, transportation, um, you know, all those activities that connect or separate food production and consumption. We haven't really engaged and we need to find ways of engaging those actors as well. Uh, I think, again, if we want to, you know, progress a systemic agenda and, uh, uh, and try to go beyond the, the production consumption divide. Thank you. Um, I wonder if we can sort of take a take a step back, maybe. So um, a question from Matthew Thompson asking about um, about provisioning or the, the uh, what he calls provisioning blindness that affects urbanists and urban policymakers. So I, I think he's asking about um, uh, uh, policies that don't include uh, food systems or don't include food even, um, not, not enough about provisioning um, when talking about kind of urban policy. So an obsession with energy, digital and transport, but not yes. food or water. Do you, do you see that as, as problematic? So here we are talking about food policy and how we can manage it, but do we need to kind of look, to take a step further back? Absolutely. This tendency 
to think in silos, you know, and to act in silos, siloed ways of working, and the uh, policy priorities that shift depending uh, also on the benefits they can produce in the short term. Um, a more efficient energy system or lower um, lowered energy prices is something that citizens would see straight away and politicians would benefit from. Changing the food system is a really hard challenge that takes time. Why would a policymaker engage with such a challenge when probably the benefits of their work are going to be seen by successors rather than themselves? Electoral cycles that come in the picture. I mean, it, this is this is why as civil society we need to remain uh, active. We need to keep pushing. We need advocacy because they forget about food. There's an entire body of literature. I'm thinking for those of you who are familiar with academic debates. I'm thinking about the work by Kami Potukuchi and Kaufman in the United States. Um, discussing the fact that there's never a word about food in the planning system. So how can we plan land use without taking food into account? Unfortunately, yes, this is ex precisely what is happening. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Energy, digitalization, things that sound very cool, and that tend to produce short-term benefits. Yeah, related to that political cycle, as you said, that sort of short-termism where you're you're just looking at your your next election. <laughs> um, uh, just to ask uh, this idea of um, transformation, food systems transformation, which is so um, commonly used, and now we're seeing sort of more and more people trying to grapple with what does this actually mean? What does it look like? What do we mean by transformation? Uh, food systems transformation. So um, one of our participants is is asking, um, how could we sell this idea of transma transformation towards a more sustainable food system to people that are happy with the status quo or not interested in the topic itself as much as we are? So um, um, maybe, you know, us as an interested group are, are interested in food policy, but maybe not, and not everybody is, as we've just been discussing. How do we kind of sell the idea of transformation towards more sustainable food systems? Well, I think that the food system is broken and in a deep state of crisis is evident, is before us. You know, it's so evident nowadays. And I'm going back again to those ju juxtaposing images that the media were portraying during COVID. On the one hand, produce left to rotten in the fields because there weren't migrant workers able to pick them up and, and collect no workers in the field. And on the other hand, very long queues of people outside food banks, people with not necessarily just poor people, but people with mobility problems who couldn't go to the supermarkets or thereabouts to feed themselves. The problem is there. And uh, I think uh, obviously we would need far more food education than we have around nowadays for people to understand that food is part of everything we do, that it's vital to human health and well being, and as such, it should never be treated like another tradable commodity. The value of food goes far beyond its price. And, uh, you know, uh, we do what we can, but you're right, there are many people who just don't make those connections. They don't uh, realize the, the trap embedded in cheap food, which, uh, as I said, it's only cheap at the point of sale, but um, only because externalities are not factored into the price. It takes time, but I have to say, over the course of 20 years of career in the UK, I've seen things improving. It's extraordinary to me now how many uh, people from the young generations are embracing plant-based diets or are flexitarian or vegan or vegetarian and do care about not having a negative impact on the environment around. So there is hope. I think we need to continue working. 
And definitely, the, I think the idea of systems, food systems approaches is, is catching on. The, this idea that uh, of um, synergies and not just across two domains, but multiple domains. And how can we how can we make those linkages and how can we improve things? There's a, there's a question which is rather philosophical um, uh, that I'm going to pose to you from um, Nafisa, um, who's asking about your place based framework. Um, and whether this would be seen, I think you might say both, but she, she's asking, he or she's asking, um, would this be seen as critical realist or pragmatic in terms of its philosophical foundation? I don't know. <laughs> I never thought about it in those terms, Nafisa. Um, I think it is both, but if I were to choose, it's more pragmatic than anything else. It's an invitation to say, let's get get let's get together and let's get going with this transformation of the food system. We have to start somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So there's a, a quite a few people also um, asking, uh, uh, talking about Brazil and uh, progressive um, policies in Brazil. Um, which is yes. uh, great to see and great to see the the interest in that. Um, Ivan, and I think we're coming up to the, to the to the end of our question. We've got about three minutes left. So if anybody has a burning question for Roberta, please post it now. I'm just uh, looking at Ivan's uh, question on um, a concept of cosmolocalism and whether we think that might help the empowerment of community agency networks in regards to food systems transformation. Is that something that you're you're aware of or that's um, played a role in your work? Uh, Rebecca, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, do you think the concept of cosmolocalism could help the empowerment of community agency networks in regard to food systems transformation? Yeah, I've never used it as such, but I remember um, using a similar expression in relation to cities like London, um, cosmopolitan localism. Uh, just to define, so so it's that concept of new localism that I have uh, presented in one of my slides, which is a very porous, flexible interpretation of the local that goes against ideas such as defensive localization, parochial versions of the local. It's an open-minded uh, local, which is very inherently cosmopolitan. So it's progressive, it's open um, to diversity and to pluralism. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's useful. Um, and I think um, we're uh, yeah, very nearly at the end, but one, maybe one uh, time for one final question um, for you around uh, uh, regenerative agriculture. Um, so thinking about some of the the uh, during your talk, you were talking about this um, perhaps false dichotomy between urban and rural um, and a new understanding that's that's come out during the course of your work or uh, over the course of the time that you've been working in this, where we're, think we're not thinking in um, sort of uh, either or anymore. We're thinking much more about rural uh, and urban areas. Um, so this attendee's asking about uh, what what role do you think regenerative agriculture, which is a kind of another buzzword or buzz term that's come up, um, can play in the transformation of our food systems within this sort of urban setting that you've been talking about? Well, I think uh, we need to come to terms with the fact that the amount of land at our disposal is not much and it co continues to shrink because of intensification and uh, specialization processes that have exhausted the nutritional quality of the soil. So we need to find alternative. It all depends on what area of the world that we are talking about, uh, what are the possibilities. There's a whole range, obviously, of um, um, initiatives. I, I just... When I talk about food system transformation, wherever it doesn't matter where I approach this topic, but for me, it's vital to remain open to a suit of solutions rather than looking for a one size fit all type of approach. Because as I said, this is a complex challenge, which also has a very strong context dependent dimension. So it varies in its manifestations, in its implications from place to place. So it's very important for us to be able to um, 
to de design context dependent solutions, keeping the principles of the click in mind. Great. Well, that's a great note uh, to end on, and uh, fantastic news about the uh, the click uh, the the funding, and um, you know, really looking forward to seeing how that work develops and progresses. Um, so it just remains for me to thank you so much, Roberta, for a really interesting talk, and for thank you so much for answering so many um, wide and varied questions. Um, and thank you, really, Rebecca. Many, many, many thanks. Oh, thank we you. really appreciate your time. Um, thanks for being with us, and thank you um, very much to everybody who's joined and everybody who's posed questions. Um, and uh, yeah, please do join us um, next time for our next Food Thinkers. Thanks, Roberta, and goodbye. Good evening to everyone. Bye.